uh, tool, once you control a state, uh, last August when Rafael Correa, the president of Ecuador, declared that the Yasuni National Park, which has about $12 billion of estimated oil reserves, would never be touched. You're going to keep that oil in the soil forever. Axion Ecologia in Quito was crucial to pushing Correa, who was a US trained economist, now quite an explicitly socialist, and you hear in the last few days after his country was just invaded to, by the Colombians. But a very, very strong statement um, from Korea. And he wants to get some compensation uh, for this. It's a big hit to his national income. Five billion is what uh, he thinks is the ecological debt that could be used to offset for um, the oil that's in the soil, for example, not paying his world bank loans. And the argument is really important to make that, that uh, we, we just should be uh, allowing countries like Ecuador to keep the oil in the soil. Um, in Canada, I think the Parkland Institute in, in uh, University of Alberta in Edmonton has argued as convincingly as anyone that uh, the oil should stay in the tar sands. And they've got a, a complicated way of sort of saying, you can take the oil out, but follow these easy steps. Well, they're not easy. Strict water limits, uh, greenhouse gas emission limits, land reclamation uh, plans, a full uh, deposit on uh, the land reclamation up front, no subsidies for the production of dirty energy, energy security for Canadians so that it doesn't all go to the USA, um, higher energy, uh, a much higher economic rents or royalties on the dirty energy to fund a clean energy and renewable industry. Um, the point, I think, is, is really clear. It's just to make it so expensive that the, that the tar sands would not be exploited. And the indigenous people are, of course, are the, the real drivers of that, having already seen so much of their water and land and air destroyed. Um, and uh, very good activist groups I saw there in a big conference. It's actually a respectable argument to make, uh, even in the Bretton Woods institutions, the Extractive Industries Review in 2003, led by an Indonesian, uh, Emil Salim, who was actually Sukarto, uh, Sukarto's uh, environmental minister. He was uh, sort of at the end of his career and uh, just became radical looking at the fossil fuel and the extractive industries uh, in the World Bank. And he, recommended phasing out landing in support of oil and coal, and instead investing in renewables. Um, well, of course, the World Bank, uh, this is even before Paul Wolfowitz, uh, who, of course, is the Petro military complexes man in, in, in Washington. And then, of course, he's out, but there's someone more or less identical, Robert Zellick, in there now. And, um, but James Wolfenson, the um, more democratic uh, uh, party uh, World Bank president, just rejected this outright, no, no chance. So the World Bank remains the major investor and the gall of Zelik uh, recently to say, well, we'll also be the major cleaner up funder of, of climate work so that they can reproduce their institution. Both the IMF and the World Bank are in big, big, big trouble. So when in Bali this kind of uh, suggestion came up that the World Bank and, you know, that the, the sort of uh, market-driven strategies uh, be considered central and the U.S. coming in was sort of going to be the big coup uh, to bring them back into Kyoto framework. Um, a whole bunch of great people decided, no, this is ridiculous. We cannot work in this uh, conference of the parties framework, the Bali you know, negotiations. Bali now moving to um, uh, Copenhagen next year. Now, uh, it's called Climate Justice Now. They gathered probably the, the best known of the, uh, of the kind of comrades leading uh, this and spoke, speaking for it is Walden Bello, who uh, I think is, uh, well, he's in and out of Toronto quite a bit, so certainly go and see him from Focus on the Global South. Carbon Trade Watch, Center for Environmental Concerns, Freedom from Debt Coalition, Friends of the Earth International, Women for Climate Justice, Global Forest Coalition, Global Justice Ecology. I could go on. Um, and uh, you see just fantastic groups representing really as, as much as we've seen anywhere at one time, uh, a collection of those arguing uh, for the rights of the victims of climate change and, uh, and, and for the world environment as a whole. So it's a, just a tremendous network that is just getting going and had a sort of big once-off launch, but I'm, I'm really hopeful that this is the sort of sustained uh, possibility of linking global justice movements and environmental movements we've all been uh, long awaiting. This is what they demanded, huge financial transfers from the north to the south based on historical responsibility and ecological debt for adaptation and mitigation costs paid for re by redirecting military budgets, innovative taxes, debt cancellation. Number two, leaving fossil fuels in the ground investing in, in appropriate energy efficiency and safe, clean, and community-led renewable energy. 
Number three, rights-based resource conservation that enforces indigenous land rights and promotes people's sovereignty over energy, forest, land, and water. And four, sustainable family farm farming and people's food sovereignty. So I think those are the, uh, the absolutely the right directions our politics has got to move towards. Um, and, of course, crucial, reduce consumption for, for northern uh, uh, hedonistic consumers and corporations. <coughs> so there's five points, right? Um, I think the key Canadian ally that I've uh, gotten to know through the web, uh, climateandcapitalism.com, but so many of you are so involved in this, and I just hope we can get uh, more uh, connections into the Durban Group for Climate Justice. For those of you worried that if Harper does want to move in and carbon trading becomes part and parcel of the techniques that you can join join up with us and, and help watch it and critique it. And, um, and from there, from that kind of green, uh, radical green analysis, let's move to the, the red uh, development agenda just briefly to, to close, because I think if we don't do that, we're, we really are at risk of saying the North's developed and should now start uh, cutting back, but the, the South doesn't have room to develop. And we've got to just at least think of, uh, about one or two of the um, components here. Yeah, I'll just mention electricity assets. Excessive fossil fuel resources we've mentioned. The ecological sink function Africa plays, and that's the ecological debt concept. Um, but here's this one I'd like to just mention for a couple of minutes. Inadequate access to electricity for poor people across Africa, combined, as I've shown you in South Africa, with uh, excessively cheap electricity for large corporations. So how do we tackle that? Um, partly because the beginning of this huge protest wave as Mandela got out of power uh, in 99. Um, well, before I tell you about that, just to remind ourselves what it is to, to be uh, an ordinary African without electricity. Where do you get your energy from? Trees and uh, fuel lots and coal and so some biomass. And how do you um, carry it around? Uh, how do you transmit the energy? Women uh, you know, carry it on their back. And then how do, you, how do you consume it? How do you consume energy? In a very dangerous place, which is an open fire within a hut, typically, in which particulates, as you see, are, are, are uh, moving throughout. Women uh, kneeling over, setting the fires, getting the cooking done, uh, getting hot water, uh, all sorts of uh, health problems and uh, respiratory issues, uh, and just uh, patriarchy being uh, amplified by this sort of very inefficient way of of getting energy. So getting electricity uh, to, to uh, the rest of Africa that doesn't have it, it's only about 30% right now. Uh, OECD is close to 100, and the world as a whole about 72% have access to, to electricity. Um, so uh, the protests that I mentioned in South Africa, uh, plus um, um, a cholera outbreak, plus uh, a constitutional court case against the government, uh, all sort of together in late 2000 compelled the African National Congress in its municipal election campaign to make this promise free basic amount of water and electricity and other municipal services so as to help the poor. It says all residents, so even me, the bourgeoisie can get this too, but like me, those who use more than the basic amounts will pay for the extra they use. And it's a really crucial um, set of um, uh, ideas, two, two core ideas in this, in this promise, uh, which was then uh, part and parcel of the ANC winning a substantial vote and getting more excitement for its uh, candidates in the year 2000. The two features I think are crucial, a universal entitlement, so everyone gets 